University Teachers Association of Ghana says it's studying an Accra High Court Labour Division ruling that restrains it from continuing its strike action. An Accra High Court Labour Division has granted an interlocutory injunction application filed by the National Labour Commission and NLC and UTAC have been battling with the legality or otherwise of the strike action which has entered the sixth week. The substantive issue as to whether the industrial action by UTAC was illegal will be heard on February 22. 2022. And it's ruling the judge opined that the court has taken judicial notice of the strike action and it is aware of some form of negotiations ongoing by the government and UTAG hence its decision to grant NLC a request. After the hearing, the executive secretary of NLC, Ofuswa Samoa, had this to say. The court said it had taken judicial notice of the fact that um, negotiations were going on. We have been to court. This is the third time. The court gave a directive in the first instance of which the Labour Commission issued an invitation to the parties to appear before it. There was a response from UTAC saying that they are unable to appear before the Commission and for that matter they, they were going to engage the government directly, which they began doing and reported that the last time in court the engagements were going on. So the court had taken judicial notice that, it had, even though there hasn't been any express um, application before the court or a filing to show what is going on, the court knew we have been engaged. You were there, you saw that the judge engaged the party. So it took judicial notice and gave effect to it. This order means that while the substantive case is being heard or is going to be heard, uh, which will start on the 22nd of March, um, the the UTAG is to call off a strike, return to the lecture hall whilst the substantive matter is being heard. And as the judge rightly referred, in their own affidavit, if the court grants this application, they have no option than to return to the lecture halls as the court directs. And exactly is what the court upheld. Now, when the court gave UTAG president uh, of, at the University of Cape Coast, Dr. Samuel Bedbuidi, the national uh, UTAG body will communicate when lecturers are expected to return to the lecture halls. He however added that the substantive issue of the condition of service for lecturers should not be ignored. But lawyer for Utah, Kwesi Kelly Delata, bemoaned how the court dealt with the injunction application before the substantive matter. The understanding of the whole matter is that um, the government had said that if they uh, did not suspend the strike, no negotiations will be had. Uh, so that's the point where we are, there's complete frigid silence on negotiations at the moment. So no negotiation. Well, so the judge had two applications before him uh, for hearing today. The first one is the substantive motion, which is taken to enforce the directives of the National Labor Commission and then an injunction application. Uh, now the thing is that the main motion which is seeking to enforce the directives of the Labour Commission was filed before the injunction application was filed. In our view, the main motion which is seeking to enforce the directives of the National Labour Commission should have been heard first, but the judge thought otherwise and decided that the injunction application should be heard first. And the outcome of that application is all to your witness in court today. Uh, the judge decided to grant the interlocutory injunction application. Uh, we are going to study uh, the order and, and advise our clients accordingly. And I wish to remind you that the main motion, which is seeking to enforce the directors of the commission, is still before the court. The hearing of that application has been adjourned to the 22nd. Uh, so on the 22nd, we'll be back in court for the main motion to be heard. And let me repeat that that main motion is seeking to enforce the directives of the commission. And the directive of the commission is that UTAC should um, go back to the classroom because the strike they have declared is illegal. So arguments will be heard on that. We we'll look forward to that with better breath. And we're very confident that uh, our arguments will sway the day. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go live to the University of Ghana campus where my colleague Manuel Crante is switching camp. Uh, Manuel, I'm grateful that you bring us updates from the University of Ghana. What can you tell us this morning? Well, so Aisha, in the past couple of minutes and a bit on the university campus, what we're seeing 
is, is you know, I'm just everything is really in the classroom. So all of them, um, as I look at them currently, have been abandoned. There are no students in sight, and also there are no lectures in sight. So this is in here opposition to um, what uh, the, the, the cost, um, the Accra High Court ordered yesterday that the lectures call off their strike um, and return to the negotiation table uh, with government and then also the National Labor uh, Commission. Um, we were told that uh, a number of the students had actually earlier in the morning attempted uh, coming to class uh, from our text at the university. The very first lecture at the University of Ghana starts at 7.30 a.m. And so at the time, there were quite a number of students who, uh, in the hope of seeing their lectures in class, had actually attempted to um, come for the lectures, but uh, to, uh, their disappointment, the lectures were not on site. And so that is indeed what is happening. No students inside, and then no lectures also inside. Essentially, the confirmation that we have is that the research strike, at least at this current material moment, um, is still, still in force here at the University of Ghana, Aisha. Um, we, we know that uh, because of the prolonged strike, students had to go back home. Um, are they coming back on campus? Do you find some students on campus? Uh, Aisha, what, what we know is that well, yes, uh, some of the students indeed um, expressed interest of wanting to go home. And some of them actually did go home. As of our last visit about two weeks ago to the university, um, what we saw was uh, a number of the students uh, being chauffeured out of campus by their parents and so on. Um, we are told that with the communication that UTAG is supposed to return to the lecture hall, some of them are getting ready to return to class. Um, the catch, however, is that they are looking forward to having a definite uh, you know, confirmation that their lectures are back in school before they return. Because as you know, uh, some of the students come from really far places, come out of Accra, and so um, they will not want to incur the cost of moving from the way to the university, and then the strike continuing to be in force. And so uh, that, that is what uh, we have. Some of them just may be uh, returning to campus, but uh, they are yet uh, to be to right now. Manuel Kranting is a man at the University of uh, Ghana uh, bringing us updates as to how the campus is looking like right now after the court ordered the UTAG uh, teachers to go back to the classrooms. We are yet to hear from the teachers whether they've decided to actually abide by this rule because they say they are studying the court rule before they can take any action. We can now go to the KNUST and speak with Dr. Daniel Norris Bekwe, who is the investor relations officer. We'll try and get um, Dr. Daniel Norris Bekwe to speak to us on this matter, but we are still also monitoring other university campuses to, uh, to uh, see whether the teachers are back in the classroom and also see whether teaching and learning is ongoing. But president at the University of Cape Coast, Dr. Samuel Bet Boedikusi, the National Utah, he says the National Utah body will communicate when lecturers are expected to return to the lecture halls. He adds that the substantive issue of the condition of service for lecturers should not be ignored. I do not disagree with you on this call at all. I do not disagree with you. But the point is that, I mean, we, it is also important that, I mean, we have a legal team in place. And, and therefore, it's important that we, we, we listen to what they are, they are, they are, I mean, the direction they have. But other than that, it is clear. I mean, the, the judge has spoken. And I don't, I, I don't think that it will be proper for anybody to disrespect the orders of the court or to dis, disrespect the orders of the judge. Uh, it is clear. But then, again, in, in carrying out that function, which is clear, it is also proper that the writer is done. That I mean, you look at uh, all the all the issues that there are, there are, and of course, what the exactly the judge uh, I mean ordered, and then we, we move it from from there. I do not think that that also it's just uh, stretching the matter. No, not at all. Uh, it's important that we don't just presume that these are the specific orders. So we need to look at what are the specific orders that came in. And then we, you carry it from there. I, I don't think that we, it's anybody wants to stretch this matter. I have said in the past that 
litigation is not the way to go. At the end of the day, uh, whatever we are doing is about conditions of service. So if you're going to spend all your time in court uh, and not touching the substantive matter, then we, we, we are not moving, we are not moving on. I mean, that is not what our members want. But of course, we were not the first people to even head to court. It's, it's the NLC that took us to court. So uh, let's follow the, the advice of the legal team and then we'll move it from there. So the you have said this before, uh, you didn't honor your part of the bargain. So now trust is a bit difficult. But beyond that, I, I think that uh, the employer should take the condition of service matter critical and then invite the union to sit and discuss these matters uh, in a very open and transparent manner, a very frank manner, and uh, try to resolve that, that issue because it affects, the, it affects morale. Right. Uh, we don't want a situation where people will go back and then they, they are even not effective at what they are doing. Uh, it affects morale. So once there is that goodwill and that assurances that your conditions, something ought to be done about it. I think that it's something that we all of us need to rally around the table and get this resolved within the shortest possible time. We'll be going back to the University of Ghana to speak with some students on how they feel about how events have turned. But a joint news and corruption watch investigation have uncovered the illegal collection of fees for blood by a syndicate operating with the National Blood Service at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital and the Greater Accra Regional Blood Bank. At the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, a staff collected 300,000 cities for a pint of blood while the leader of a syndicate operating within the National Blood Service at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital demanded 750,000 cities for a pint of blood. Chief Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justina Ansan, says no patient is expected to pay more than 150 cities for the processing of blood. Joy News investigative desk and corruption watchers Francisca Encho investigate the distressing experience many patients go through as a result of this illegal practice. In Ghana, there is high blood scarcity as the blood banks are not able to collect enough to meet the demand. For patients in dire need of blood transfusion, they either have to pay exorbitant fees charged by some hospitals or go through middlemen who facilitate the illegal purchase of blood at the hospitals. This lady who pleaded anonymity said she's been asked to pay 250 Ghana cities for a pint of blood. Cost is therefore a barrier to patients who need blood to survive. <laughs> Na na or something you just see her for in, in, in case of any eventuality. But no more general. And say, may I am in your beyond so a manner and a and a united emergency. And say, in your beyond my name, ye more general. And say, now I say it to uh, 250. That is the plight of some relatives of patients who are desperately in need for blood for their families on admission to the hospital. Unfortunately, the fees charged for blood has left them distraught. This middle-aged woman says blood bank operators she contracted demanded 400 Ghana cities for a pint. The hospital is have a period here. The period is here in sky, it's 150 million. We don't have eight in a much from my, and then you see someone who's here, I can't do. In this case, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to talk to you, the National Blood Service says blood is not supposed to be sold. However, one is required to pay a processing fee to run laboratory tests on blood requested for transfusion. The service says the cost of processing this blood should not exceed 150 Ghana cities. Chief Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justin Ansa, reveals the shortage of voluntary blood donations is the reason for the abuse of the system by unscrupulous individuals. Because of the scarcity and artificial shortage that is created, people who want to make 
um, take advantage of the system because there's always shortage. Also, for the, so there may be somebody who pays the processing fee, group and cost margin to the bank, giving a receipt. But around the person, they may also have gotten somebody to come and donate for them, or and then would have paid some money. So these are some. Of, but to be able to care that, I will repeat that we need to make sure that blood is an essential commodity. Is 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 is. We have it in excess. The sale of blood has become lucrative because only six out of every 1,000 of Ghana's population donates blood. The expected minimum is 10 out of every 1,000. According to the National Blood Service, the national voluntary blood donation rate has declined steeply from 34% of total blood donations in 2019 to 17% in 2020. Dr. Ansar adds that over the same period, the percentage of voluntary donations collected by blood centers in Accra, Kumasi and Tamale has recorded a corresponding decline from 52% in 2019 to 24% in 2020. So I just want to state that we don't have enough blood. We're only meeting about 60% of our collections uh, of what we need as a country. So definitely some people will be disadvantaged, which means that some people will not get blood when they need and it will affect more of emergencies. In order to find out how official and unofficial sale of blood occurs at some of our hospitals, our investigative team went undercover at Kolebu Teaching Hospital and the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, formerly known as Ridge Hospital. At the Kolebu Teaching Hospital, we approached Eric Mensa, popularly referred to as Akwesi, among his peers, a man in his early 30s. He claimed to work at the blood bank situated at Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Our follow-up investigations established that he is the leader of a syndicate that facilitates the illegal purchase of blood at the hospital. We told him we needed blood for a patient with ovarian cancer. He demanded 750 Ghana cities for a pint of blood, but after intense negotiation, he reduced it by 50 Ghana cities. So we agreed to pay 700 Ghana cities. <laughs> We did not have the required blood sample and requisition form from an accredited hospital, but Akwesi took down payment of 100 Ghana cities, promising to give us blood once we pay in full. After providing blood sample and a requisition form, he provided the investigative team with a pint of blood. He did not give us a receipt for this transaction. It was the same for this desperate woman who needed a blood type O plus for the patient on admission at Kolebu. The request also did not go through the proper channel. The right thing to do was that the blood sample and requisition form should have been submitted at the designated post at the blood bank and an official receipt issued for the cost of processing the blood. 
Many other patients we spoke to shared similar stories of exploitation by some staff of the blood bank. We asked Chief Executive Officer of the National Blood Service, Dr. Justine Ansa, whether she is aware of the middlemen operating as a syndicate that facilitates illegal sale of blood at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Because of the scarcity and artificial shortage that is created, people who want to make um, take advantage of the system because there's always shortage. Also, so there will be somebody who pays the processing fee, group and cost margin to the bank, giving a receipt. But around the person, they may also have gotten somebody to come and donate for them, or and then would have paid some money. The investigative team also visited the Greater Accra Regional Hospital, formerly Reach Hospital, to look into the illegal sale of blood. At the facility, an official at the blood bank demanded 300 cities for a pint of blood. <laughs> We submitted a blood sample and requisition form with details of a hospital located in the Ashanti region. They did not do any further due diligence to ascertain that the facility was in the national capital but gave us the blood in a flask to be given to the patient. The medical director of the Great Accra Regional Hospital, Dr. Emmanuel Sorpeño, says the processing fee of blood at the facility should not exceed 100 Ghana cities. He finds it unacceptable that a staff demanded 300 Ghana cities for a pint of blood at the hospital. The fact of the matter is that blood is an essential material which is needed to save lives. So normally our policies vary depending on the circumstances. If somebody has an emergency on hand and needs blood urgently, we provide the blood. Uh, as and when she or he needs the blood, we provide the blood, but then they are then expected to pay what we call the processing fee. This, it is important for me to explain okay. what I mean by the processing fee. Blood itself, the blood itself, is not for payment because it's a gift of nature. It's not for payment. But when you take blood, we expect you to pay a processing fee because when the blood is donated, what happens is that we don't just transfuse it fresh as it is donated. It is processed. We do various tests, various investigations are done to check whether there is HIV, hepatitis, syphilis tests. All these things are done and it costs, there is a cost to them. So those costs are placed on the blood. So anybody who is coming to take that pint of blood will have to pay for that processing fee. That's what we call processing fee. Currently, to the best of my knowledge, the processing fee is 100 Ghana cities. Uh, that is what, uh, and then when you pay the processing fee, you'll be given a receipt. So any payment that is done without receipt is an illegality. Every minute, Many more Ghanaians have to scale this barrier in their struggles for survival. Those who cannot afford may have to go home and die while a cartel continues to rip off the few who have the means to pay. And that's a, a jury news investigative piece with uh, the uh, Corruption Watch. Uh, they did this work together and it uh, highlights how a staff of the Kolebu Teaching Hospital collected 300 Ghana cities for a pint of blood. Um, a staff at the Accra Regional Hospital collected 300 cities for a pint of blood and a national uh, a syndicate working within the blood service at the Kolebu Teaching Hospital also demanded 750 cities uh, for a pint of blood. Uh, we'll bring you this uh, investigative piece again in our subsequent bulletins and we'll try and get response from the appropriate 
authorities. We can now go back to the University of Ghana and uh, speak with students on how the one of the court order is faring. Manuel Cranting is our man there. Manuel, uh, what more can you tell us? What are students saying? Well, yes, Aisha, in just the past couple of minutes, I've been able to catch up with a few students who actually, uh, on their hindsight, were coming to um, the lecture. I'm currently at the Jones Court building. This is uh, perhaps one of the busiest, the most, you know, uh, busy lecture halls in the University of Ghana. And at 10.15, 10.20, 10.30 a.m., you would have had a lot of activities with lectures ongoing, with students moving in and out of the various lecture halls. As you can see in your shot in my background there, the lecture halls are currently under lock and key with nobody entering and nobody actually also uh, coming out. But uh, I've been able to get a few students and they are now, uh, you know, embarking on their own private studies and so on and so forth. Some of them came uh, from home. Uh, others are also resident on campus and essentially what they have uh, come here to do was to get access to um, their uh, lectures but that is not happening. Let me just speak to this gentleman uh, first and foremost. What's your name gentleman? You're live on a Join News channel. What's your name? I am Mohamed Said. Okay, you're a student? I'm a student. Okay, which level are you in? Level 100. Okay, so what, what, what are you doing here? I came to have my private studies. Okay. Yes, that's why I came here. But are you aware that um, your lecturers, for instance, were supposed to have come uh, to class today? Yes, I heard about that yesterday and I also came here. I didn't see anything about that, whether they have called off the strike or not. I didn't see any lectures going on. But what was your expectation? I was expecting that they will follow the court orders so that they will come, to come back to lectures hall so that we too enjoy the lectures. Yes. As, as a level 100 student, you are even yet to have your very first lecture, properly speaking, in the university. This must be quite devastating for you. Yes, please. And it's just our first time and we don't even know like what we are to do. Like, even we don't have any handouts to start doing our own uh, studies. So we are just stranded. Yes, we are just stranded. So you want your lecturers, am I hearing you say you want your lecturers to listen to the court and return to class today? Yes, per my candid opinion, they should. We are ready to learn. Yes, and where we are from is, is far, it's far. So where are you from? I'm from Bole. So it's far. So Bole what? B Bole? Bole Bamboy. Okay. Yes, so where we are now is far. So I'm afraid if I'm going back and they say they have called it the strike off again, so I'll be coming back here. So that's why I'm still here. Yes. Other than that, I will have been at home. Okay. Thank you very much. And so just one of the students there, and I'm just catching up with a couple more. Uh, what's your name? My name is Angelo Oisu. I see you working, I, I don't know what, maths or what have you, but uh, you, you were expecting to see your lecturers today in class? Oh yes, I was expecting, per the court ruling yesterday, I was expecting them to call off the strike today, but then we came here and there are no lecturers, so I was just doing my personal studies. Mm -hmm. And this is what you've been doing the entire, what, six weeks or so? That uh, been yes, that's what I've been doing, so that when school resumes, I wouldn't be able to, I would be able to catch up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so now that they are not coming, what are you taking away? Are you going to go home or are you going to go back to your hall? Um, for now, I think I'll just be on campus and have my personal study because if I go home, um, my parents will bombard me with um, errands, so I don't want to go. So I'll be on campus and have my personal studies. <laughs> so you are, you are skipping errands. Uh, but but are, you, are you hoping that even though they are not in class today, they'll come, you know, soon? Yes, because as students and as a final year student, I'm expecting that this strike is going to be over because even per the court ruling, when they come back, it's going to really, I don't know how the university is going to structure our academic calendar because we are expecting to have 11 weeks and we've already spent five weeks out of class and it's really going to affect some of us, especially the final year students. So, so the earlier the better for you? Yes, please. Because it's going to, it could be a waste of time for both the lecturers and us. Okay, okay. Uh, waste of time.
of time for both the lectures and you. I'll just wrap up with um, these ones. I don't know what exactly what this is the account office and they could be accessed. Are you, are you going to the account office? No, no, not at all. <laughs> I mean, from all indications in the media yesterday, I knew the lectures would not be on campus, but you know, see for yourself. Okay. So that's why I'm here. And I saw some friends, so we're just talking. This, this is, is, is it disappointing to you or you are in support of your lecturer's decision not to come to the class? Hmm. I really want my lecturers back to class, but knowing that when they return to class, after a few weeks, they may also, you know, go back. Go back. I, I feel like they should just be on strike and get all their issues resolved. Then they can come to us. They will be ready for them. Mm. And, and so, Aisha, this is, if you like, um, a cocktail of the views of the, some, of some of the students that I've been speaking to, essentially, um, here at the University of Ghana. The lecturers still out of class for them who decided, uh, you know, against hope to come and see if their lecturers are in class or they've been disappointed and they are now asking uh, for their lecturers to return to class while others say, you know what, settle all your issues before you return. Aisha, um, this is a picture at the University of Ghana. Manuel Kranting is our man monitoring for us at the University of Ghana. We'll still bring you more updates in our subsequent bulletins. We're also across all the universities in Ghana. We'll try and bring you updates from what is happening from those universities. But finding a place to commune with God is critical for many, especially in a very religious country like Ghana. But the country's deaf community is often lost in search of a place to worship. Most churches do not provide for sign language interpretations of their service, and a shortage in number of interpreters mean there are only a few available for the churches who do so. In the following report, Joy News' Justice Beidou goes to church with the deaf. Her name is Akos. Akosia has Akos. been deaf all her life. Ten years ago, she left Suhum, her hometown, to come and live in Accra. She used to attend a mainstream church that had an interpreter, but she had to stop going because she says she didn't like it. Uh, uh, the, 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 the preaching over there is not the same. The word of God is not the same, though the Bible is one, but the way they are, they are preaching is not the, the same. Hmm. When they preach, they say, ah, no, this is not what I want. Last year, she found one of the very few churches for the deaf in Kukumlimli. They are across suburb where she lives. Mm -hmm. Soon after she joined, the school, the school in which they worship threw them out. Yeah. And now mm -hmm. she walks from Kukumlimli to Abusuokai, a journey of about 45 minutes, where the church has now moved to. This church is where Akusia worships now. Inside, the congregants. All of them, deaf, are busy in worship. Around 500,000 deaf people live in Ghana. The fraction in this church today are only a tiny bit of that number. Many mainstream churches in Ghana do not have sign language interpreters. And the stigma around being deaf means even if they did have interpreters, many of these people would not go there. In here, in the small space, the deaf community do not only have a place to commune with their God, but also a refuge where they can worship with people like them. I am Kwevi Asiyama de Israel. So the Lord has given me the, uh, the commission to be with the deaf community. We have uh, over 80 people and we have run this church more than, more than 25 years now. If sign language is a recognized language in Ghana, what a wonderful, it will be a wonderful thing. Yes, it will really help the nation because uh, these people 
uh, assuming we are like we in a, in society, people understand the way people understand tree airway ga, and then the deaf come to you, and then you can communicate with them. Mostly when they go to the hospitals, they tr struggle. The struggle they go through at the hospital is another thing altogether. So as you mean, the nurses, the doctors, they also know uh, this language. They can sign. So they will be able to tell, the, I mean, we, we will not have a lot of uh, problem. So if this, this language is made as a national, it's also it's recognized in society, it will really help the, the nation. Because the deaf cannot speak, when they want to pray, they close their eyes, use sign language to say what they want to say, and keep clapping to send their message across. Those who have partial speaking ability mama out words. Only they can understand. Um, when you hear, you see the, the hearing people, you go there and then uh, they are preaching, you don't hear anything, you only sleep, sleep, sleep. The only thing that we do is amen. I watch the mouth of the pastor and then I see, uh, when the pastor say amen, I know that he's saying amen. Then I also say amen and we don't benefit. The challenges that deaf people have finding a place to worship is only a tip of the iceberg and shows a much bigger problem. Many mainstream schools do not have interpreters. Several hospitals don't. And schools for the deaf are few. The sign language is not recognized officially in Ghana. Deaf people are only a small part of Ghana's community of the physically challenged. The issues they face with inclusivity in this day and age is only a stark reminder of how much more work needs to be done to make everyone feel a part of the bigger Kenyan society. Justice Beidu, Joy News, Accra. I'm back here in the studio. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Lands and Natural Resources Minister Samuel Abujinapo and Chairperson for the Apiatic Reconstruction Fund, Joyce Rosalind Ai, have called on the general population to contribute generously towards the reconstruction of the obliterated town. The call for urgent action, according to the minister and the chairperson, is needed to prevent further deterioration in the life of people who have suffered a major setback and are going through a difficult stage in their lives. The minister made the call when he donated 20,000 cities at the ministry on Tuesday to help in the rebuilding process. At this indeed should be, as they say in our local parlance, a Yibima kind of uh, fund and uh, little um, donations here and there and together we can build this community out of our generosity and out of our collective efforts and hopefully without the contribution of the public exchequer uh, and, and also the contribution of uh, foreign uh, contributions or uh, donations and we can own the process ourselves. And so I'm here to make a modest contribution of 20,000 Ghana cities. I don't have to disclose the salary of a minister. I think if, if I did, everybody would understand why it has to be 20,000 Ghana cities. So thank you very much, madam. And here yeah. I Addressing the media, the chairperson of the fund, Joyce Rosalind Aye, promised to make judicious use of the fund and make a proper account to the Ghanaian people every step of the way. We can even give you the collections we are making so that you can put them out there. This is supposed to be transparent. So we can tell you how much we really are receiving. There's nothing to hide. And when we do make disbursements, we will let you know what those disbursements are for. You know, we live in a, a period where people are very cynical mm -hmm. and uh, people are wondering whether this is going to be a scam. I can assure you, there is no scam. There will be no scam. And every amount of money that we raise will be used uh, to 
support the reconstruction. In fact, we have even told the minister that we don't even want our own operational spending to come from the fund. We told the minister, and he agrees with us, so that none of us as members will take a pessoa out of the fund, not for anything. We'll take a break. We'll bring you more in business. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Business. My name is Daryl Kwao. Ghanaian food manufacturing industries have been urged to adopt aesthetic presentations of local cuisines. Prof, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Kwame University of Science and Technology, Professor Ellis Osu Dabo, says adding value to indigenous foods will engage export potentials, generate income, and sustainably preserve local dishes. He spoke at this year's edition of the KNUST Food Festival aimed at contributing to the attainment of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Emmanuel Bright Kweku has more. The 2022 edition of the KNUST Food Festival brought together students and staff from diverse cultural backgrounds. It was a platform for the rich display of the Ghanaian culture and heritage through local cuisines and dances. Dubbed Achieving the SDGs, Our Food, Our Culture, Our Health, the event saw various departments of the university and local businesses showcasing their indigenous foods and agricultural products. Pro Vice Chancellor of KNUSD, Professor Ellis Double, says a decorative presentation of local dishes would attract commercialization. We need to learn the art of food presentation. Uh, first, uh, we can talk about the whole value chain, but importantly for us now, as you saw during the rounds uh, we had in the last few minutes, the, the presentation of the, of the food uh, type brings value. And I guess as a country, we are interested in value addition as far as uh, our products are concerned. So that we be able to export these things, uh, seek for partners who will be interested in ensuring that the manufacturing chain is uh, enhanced. Ghana's local delicacies stand at a gradual extinction due to the influx of exotic cuisines over the last decade. Bemoaning the diminishing popularity of, of Ghanaian dishes, keynote speaker, Professor Daniel Dia called for the integration of culture into the 2030 SDG agenda. According to him, the protection and promotion of diverse cultural expressions are the core components of human and sustainable development. Culture must be regarded as the fourth pillar of sustainability, and I fully align with this assertion. For instance, there have been calls for the inclusion of one specific goal to be devoted to culture or better still, an integration of cultural aspects across the SDGs for easy adaptation and implementation contextually. Ashanti Regional Director of Agriculture, John Menu, assured the government's flagship program, Planting for Food and Jobs, aims at creating a thriving environment for local agricultural businesses. Currently, the national policy is to promote planting for food and jobs. So at the end of the day, Government is subsidizing seed and fertilizer for farmers so that they can produce more of our local food. For Joy News, Emmanuel Bright Kweku reporting. Now, many see bars conducting in Ghana as a demanding profession meant for men, but Akofa, a final year student of the University of Ghana, has defied all odds by juggling it with academics. My colleague James Eshen tells her story. I called him and like, I want to do a mate job. He said, no, you can't do it. I'm like, look, I can do it. He said, it's for mainly, it's difficult, so you rather prefer a meal. And I told him, look, give me three days. If I don't perform, just let me go, suck me. So at times I go to lectures on weekends, at times so I don't go. Doesn't that affect you? If I don't go a day, it affects my finances. So if I don't work a day, so I mix it. If I go this week, probably next week, I'll go to lessons. Yeah, at least I try to read myself too. As far as I don't go to anybody, give me food, give me this. 
I can do something to feed myself, to cater for myself, everybody should back up. Let me just do my what, did, did you have a discussion with your landlord um, on the very first day, after the very first day, what you went to? Because no. So no. how come he concluded that you couldn't wake up? Uh, I don't know. He said he has done it before. It's very difficult. So uh, he doubts if I can. But well, look, I'm a very strong person. At the end of the day, I know that nobody's change is here except I have money folded like this. But I know those days when, when I was in this position, there are times I used to mafia. Let me use the word mafia. The My chobo driver, is exactly the chobo. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, do you also is there anything okay. of that sort? It's okay. Mm. You said you were going to long journeys. Yeah, that was Madina to Saoko. So probably you get some chobo. Mm. This one, the driver knows how much he gets in a one set. So even if you do pick and drop, pick and drop, how many people will you pick on the road? So you can't steal the person. The full story is on the marketplace at 1 p.m. today. Don't miss it. Up next, sports. And that's how we we'll also wrap up News Desk. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Many thanks for watching. For more news, log on to myjawonline.com. you get updates of all the developing stories. See you again at 12.